Also, uh, we have a um, movie night coming up at the Litchfields. I don't see the Litchfields here. Are they downstairs, Eric? Are they downstairs? Don't know? If you're downstairs, welcome. And thank you for hosting a movie night. They, they do it outside. They put up a screen, and they've got uh, uh, surround sound going down there at their house. And that is going to be on, does anybody know the date? I feel terrible. It's, it's Wednesday? This Wednesday? At, uh, at their house. I'll send out an email and let you know. Uh, we also need a volunteer. Since our stalwart member, uh, Dave Ward, has not uh, come back yet, he's the one who takes the recycling out here to the left of the church, and it's been piling up. So we would love a volunteer to take that recycling and cash it in. This money goes towards um, our youth ministry in KBC uh, throughout the year. So um, please, it's right over here, and um, it would be a great way to serve the church. Uh, finally, we have our membership spotlights. Th these are things that we've been doing throughout the, the scattered worship time to try and keep us together, to, to remind us of, of the members that maybe aren't here. Uh, so we have three today. Try and guess who this is in our body. This person, when, when they were 13, when they were 13, took a train ride from New Jersey to Chicago to visit his grandparents by himself by himself. Who would get on a train at 13 and go, do you think? Dave Ward. You're exactly right. <laughs> Dave Ward. <laughs> I love that. That's like, yeah, Dave Ward. Uh, the, New, yeah, the New Jersey gave it away, right? This person has been a park ranger in, are you ready for this? Acadia, Guadalupe Mountains, Carlsbad Caverns, Black Canyon, Mammoth Cave, Cayuga Valley and Boston National Historic Park. Who? Kristen Dillon is not Kristen Dillon. That was a good guess, though. Not Don Jenkins. I know he's back there. Not you, Don. It is Lori Olson. Lori Olson. She's no longer a park ranger, but she was a park ranger all over the place. And this person, 20 years ago, married her high school sweetheart, and on their honeymoon in Jamaica, they jumped off the famous 35-foot cliff at Rick's Cafe. And maybe I have a picture of it here. Can you go to the next slide? Mine doesn't seem to work. Who would dare to jump off that cliff, do you think? Mary Beale. Mary Beale, definitely. <laughs> Don Carroll, it is Don Carroll. She's the crazy one jumping off a 35-foot cliff. Did it hurt? No. No. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of thinking going down. <laughs> I bet it was. That is so funny. Thanks for sending these in. Continue to do that. This is a way that we can stay together just in another little way as we're still kind of scattered. So uh, especially those of you at home that we haven't seen in a while, send in those tidbits, please. Okay, now we can begin to quiet our hearts and minds and focus ourselves on the reason that we came here. It's wonderful to be able to, to talk about each other and laugh and, and get to know each other that little bit more, but we are here to worship the living God. And so let's, through the prelude and the moment of silence, let's begin to focus our, our minds and hearts.
Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years are unsearchable. For he draws up the drops of water, and they distill his mist and rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds and the thundering of his pavilion? Lord, we come into your gates with splendor. We come with joy. We come anticipating great things that you will do in our hearts and minds through your word today. But we also come with a fear that is appropriate to being in the presence of the most high, most powerful, omniscient, omnipotent God. Father God, help us to to worship you appropriately today. Help us to worship you with the attention that you deserve, that this is just not another thing that we do, not a religious activity, but we are actually entering into your presence. Lord God, help us to worship you in a way that, that honors you, that honors who you are. And Lord, again, let us just rejoice that you have chosen us before the foundations of the world to be here, worshiping you, loving you. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gift that is salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Psalm 17 tells us, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I wake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. As we sing to our Lord, let's stand stand together and praise him. It's for me, the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I see. The only name that matters to me Yours will be The friendship and the fashion I need To feel my father smiling on me The only name that matters to me Yours is the name, the name that saved me Mercy and grace the part that forgave me and your love is all I ever needed yours will be the only name that matters to me the only one who flavor I see the only name that matters to me and yours is the name the name that saved me, mercy and grace, the power that forgave me, and your love is all I have needed. I wake up in the land of glory, with the saints I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name I proclaim Shepherd and King, Redeemer, Creator Lion of Judah, Alvar Omega Savior and friend I am Light of the world Jesus, 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 just that name. Jesus, 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 
is just that name. When I wake up in the land of glory, with the saints I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Shepherd and King, Redeemer, Creator Lion of Judah, Offer, Omega Savior and Friend, I am Light of the world Light of the world Light of the world darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood-stained brow is the power of the cross Christ became sin for us took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross now the daylight flees now the ground beneath quakes as his maker bows his head curtain torn in two Dead our race to life, finish the victory cry. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. And forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds, quick suffering, I am free. Death is crushed to death, life is mine to live, won through your selfless love. Is the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost, we stand forgiven at the cross. Is the power of the cross. Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cause, we stand forgiven at the cross.
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is only bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will be. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled, and suffer for my pardon and he has strength to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chains are released i can sing i am free Yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus. For He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me. Until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, Till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Dear Lord Jesus, you are the one who redeem us and free us from the bondage of sins. You are the master of our lives now. Use it as you see fit. In your victorious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. In Malachi chapter 3, God is challenging his people. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. So easy to misinterpret verses like this and think that it's a quid pro quo type of thing we're doing here. If I give sacrificially enough, God is on the hook to bless me. But actually, he's, he's teaching us something radically different here. He's, he's trying to show us how, how radically generous he is through our giving. My mom used to tell me that if you are a clean pipe in your giving, if you just give, God will change your heart, and whatever you have will be enough. So it's really about our heart being changed. Let that be 
something that happens here today as we give. We sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Heavenly Father, we offer this to you so that you can do good through it, so that you can build your kingdom through it. Use this, Lord, for your glory. Help us not to be people who give expecting something in return, but to give knowing that that you are changing our hearts as we do it. Lord, we want to be more like you in this area particularly. Help us, Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray that. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to stand as we sing our first hymn, We Praise Thee, O God, our Redeemer. Please be seated. We're going to roll into our time of prayer as a body. We haven't done this in a while, but we're going to do some congregational prayer. Uh, we've been doing pastoral prayers in this time when we're scattered because of the, 
because of the nature of it and the streaming of it, but as, we, as our body begins to gather, we want to begin again to get into the rhythm of praying as a body of Christ. And so I will lead us through the Acts prayer. It's, a, it's found in the Psalms and uh, all, all over the place, how it, we lead from adoration to confession to thanksgiving and then to supplication, asking for what, uh, how God can help us in our lives. Uh, when, when we do adoration, I just want to encourage you to be thinking of who God is. You know, many times we go, okay, how do I adore God? In, in Scripture, you adore God by reflecting back to Him your meditations on, on His character. So think of the attributes of God as you pray. And let's, uh, let's begin our prayer time through adoring Christ. Please bow with me. Lord God, in your word you say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. Lord, you are an amazing God in so many ways, so many ways that we forget so many ways that we overlook, so many ways that, that we don't even think about. But Lord, you have, you have presented yourself as a giving, forgiving, loving God. And Lord, as we enter into this time of adoration, I ask you to remind us, even through our devotions this morning, of who you are and help us to praise and adore you. Hear the prayers of your people. Lord, you are a just God. You're a God who, who loves the balance of scales. Lord, help us to be those type of people. Lord, your word in Proverbs 28 tells us, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Lord, many times it is so hard to open our mouths in front of others to confess our sins, but I ask you to give us courage to do that, and courage to come before you, the almighty God who forgives sin, to find mercy by confessing our sins. Lord, hear our confessions.
Lord, please forgive me for having such apathy towards you and towards others, Lord. Forgive me. Lord, forgive me when I confess my, the bitterness that I hold towards people sometimes. Lord, forgive me for that. Lord, you are so faithful to us that you forgive us our sins. You wash them as white as snow. Thank you for being that kind of God that gives mercy over and over and over for the same sins, Lord. Help us to be a, a humble people when it comes to our sin. Lord, you have given us the wonderful way to come before you in thanksgiving. In Colossians 3, you tell us that whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That's what we want to do right now, Lord. We want to give you thanks for how you have taken care of us so well. Help us to, to remember those times, especially that you have been kind to us and mention them here. I'm giving you all the glory. Hear the prayers of thanksgiving to your, of your people. Lord, I thank you for the gift of mercy that you've given to my wife, how she cares for our family so well, and my daughter that uh, is recovering from, from wisdom teeth surgery and and me, Lord, over the past six months. I just thank you for her.
In Jeremiah 33, you tell us to call to you. And you say, I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Lord, you're a God that wants relationship with his people. You're not this distant dictator that just wants the power. You, you want the relationship more. You want to know us intimately, and you want us to reach out to you. You want us to depend on you, and this is the time when we come to do that, to tell us the ways in which we cannot control our lives, but you can. Lord, hear our prayers of supplication. continue to pray for Heap Him, our missionary who is diagnosed with stage 4 leukemia. and we Praise you, Lord, that you have him here in the States for this and not back in Cambodia, that the medicine that he needs can be, can be had here. And we pray for his chemotherapy, that you will heal his body through that medicine that you have given us. I pray for his family, that you will fortify them spiritually during this time so difficult, especially for Jennifer, his wife. Lord, be with them. Let them know that <coughs> although we're absent in the body, we are present with them in spirit. Continue to pray for Dory and her recovery from hip surgery and for Merrill. And thank you, Lord, for the wonderful diagnosis that uh, the lump was taken out and they think they've gotten all the cancer. Thank you for that, Lord God. Continue to pray that you will protect her and, and be with uh, Ted and the whole family, Lord. Lord, we pray for this church and its unity, that even though we are, we are apart from each other, that, that the evil one will not wiggle its way in to, to, our, to our hearts and minds and separate us even more. Lord, we thank you for the unity and the wonderful uh, real season that we've had in this church for so many years, and we give you the glory for that, Lord. It's not because... Uh, we try so hard. It's because of you, Spirit, that just binds us together. Do that more and more. Help us to become a closer family, one that loves each other to the point of sacrifice, as your son did for us. Help, help us to always recall that and preach that to ourselves. And it's in your wonderful and glorious name, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. I'd like you to ask you to please stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to read from 1 Peter 2, verses 21 to 24. Let's say together as a body, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself 
to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. Please have a seat. It's wonderful just to say the gospel out loud, isn't it? And hear others say it as well. Please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 5. We're working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. We've come to verses 38 through 42. As you turn there, you may remember the famous court case of Lieback versus McDonald's restaurants, also known as the hot coffee lawsuit. It's one of those famous lawsuits that we've all kind of heard about. It was sort of a tipping point in, in, in tort law, as I understand it, and it set a precedent that, that many have followed since then. If you don't know it, on February 27, 1992, Stella Lieback, a 79-year-old woman from Albuquerque, New Mexico, ordered a 49-cent cup of coffee from the McDonald's drive-in. Liebeck was the passenger in the seat of a 1989 Ford Probe, which happened to have no cup holders. So, her grandson parked the car so that she could add her cream and sugar to her coffee. So she placed the coffee between her knees and pried the lid off towards her. And in so doing, she spilled the cup of coffee all over her lap. In the process, she got third-degree burns. She sued McDonald's and won, and the court awarded her $2.86 million in damages. Now, part of the image of God that we have, part of the image of God is that we seek justice. We want justice. When you feel badly about somebody else being hurt, that's your image of God where justice is concerned coming to life. When we're hurt, we want justice. We want the scales to be even. But the trouble is, our sinful nature warps the image of God. That's what sin does. It takes how God has made us perfectly, and it just warps each aspect of that. And how our sinful nature, how our flesh warps justice, is that we don't want just the scales to be level. We want more, don't we? We want more than what is just. We want more than just getting even. While a new creation in us craves those scales to be balanced, our sinful nature wants them tipped in our direction. It wants to hurt the other person more than we were hurt. It wants the others to suffer just a little bit more than we suffered. In our sinful eyes, that feels like justice. So here Jesus reminds us of what, Je- of what justice actually looks like. And then, and this is a big then, and then he really presses in and challenges our righteousness. He really presses in. Look with me at verse 38 in chapter 5. These are Jesus' words, and he's speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. And he says again, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him also the other. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Please bow with me in prayer. Father God, I ask you, to help me preach this difficult passage well. Holy Spirit, take my words 
and enliven them. Use them in people's hearts and minds and challenge us and encourage us in being more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps no other part of the Sermon on the Mount makes us ask more internal questions as it's read, right? I bet you were sitting there listening to it and there were some buts and howevers going on in your mind, right? Also, no other part of the Sermon on the Mount has been so poorly interpreted over the centuries. It's been used to call Christians to be anything from spiritual doormats to a call for military passivity. Even cited as a proof text, this is cited as a proof text for a call to a utopian society devoid of authority. If you've read Tolstoy's War and Peace, this is actually one of the verses that he bases part of his, his whole book on. One of his thesis was, if we eliminate authorities like the police and military and rulers, we will promote a more utopian, peaceful society. I mean, all we have to do today is look at the cities and, and how that's turning out, and we know that's not true. But Jesus here begins to correct all this by first recalling what the Old Testament calls lex talionis. And he's doing that in verse 38. He says here, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What Jesus is reminding them of here is, is the Old Testament principle of lex talionis, known more literally as the law of the claw. Lex talionis was the law that administered just, justice equally. It administered justice equally, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It was there so that the, the, the foundation of the law would be a balance of justice. And it teaches that, that the punishment should fit the crime. The punishment should fit the crime. That sounds very like our law today. We see it clearly stated this, this lex talionis in three specific texts in the Old Testament, in Exodus 21, in Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. I'll read for you Exodus 21, verses 22 to 25, to give us a taste of it. God's word there says, If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no significant injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the courts allow. But if there is serious injury, you are to take a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, and a bruise for a bruise. So what this law is doing, first of all, is it's really giving Israel's judges and the people a just foundation for justice. It's giving them a foundation for justice, for what justice looks like. So in the example here, during, during the course of two men in a brawl, if they, if they bump up or hit a pregnant woman even by accident and she gives birth prematurely, there is to be some sort of retribution, some sort of payment, some sort of justice meted out here. Now, if the baby comes out and the baby is fine, but there's still this premature uh, thing that happened, th there is to be a fine. And the, the husband would go to the judge and say, I think it should be this much. And the judge would either agree or disagree. The judge, this objective authority, trying to keep the scales balanced. If the husband said, I think it's worth $2.86 million. The judge would probably bring that down. But if the baby comes out and is harmed, or if the baby actually dies, Lex Talionis tells us a life for a life, a tooth for a tooth, a bruise for a bruise, a wound for a wound. That, those, that is the balance of the scales. Now just as an aside here, this is a wonderful text that you can go to, to, to really reassure ourselves of the sanctity of life in the womb, can't we? God sees that baby in the womb as, as just not a piece of flesh, but a person, a life. That's in God's word here. 
So in your life, getting back to text uh, Lex Talionis, in your life, if someone spills coffee on you, there might be an appropriate justice, but certainly not $2.86 million. That's simply not balanced. So basically, Lex Talionis is like training wheels for justice for us. It's like training wheels. Because God is a just God. And one of the attributes of his character is justice, as we just prayed about a few minutes ago. He is a just God. He perfectly balances the scales. And he wants his people, us, to be like him in that way. He wants us to be a just people, to seek after justice in a balanced way, just like he does. So when we come to things like Black Lives Matter and the death of of George Floyd, we shouldn't get caught up in all the political and racial minutia going on here. We should be a people that are seeking after what justice is, regardless whether you're Democrat or Republican, regardless whether you're white, black, or red. It doesn't make a difference. What is just here? That's what we are called as a people of God to do, to look past all that fog and seek justice. And seeking equal justice is hard, especially when you've been hurt. That's a hard thing to do, when you've been hurt, because we tend to want excessive retribution, don't we? That's what our flesh pulls us towards. That's what, we, that's what we see in the response of George Floyd's death, don't we? This excessiveness. And that is the second tendency Lex Talionis balances. It prevents excessive retaliation and vendettas. God gave this law so that excessive retribution, excessive vengeance would not be taken because our sinful nature perverts justice. We, are, we become selfish in this. Listen to how Hannah Whitehall, in her book, The Christian Secret of Happiness, describes our minds when we're hurt. Listen to how she describes our minds when we're hurt. Have you never tasted the luxury of indulging in hard thoughts against those who, as you think, have injured you? Have you ever known what a positive fascination it is to brood over their unkindness, to pry into their malice, and to imagine all sorts of wrong and uncomfortable things about them? It has made you wretched, of course, but it has been a fascinating sort of wretchedness that you could not easily give up. I think she hits our nature on the head, don't don't you? That's, That's what we do. She's being pretty honest here. Our proclivity when we get hurt is to brood over it, to stew, to ruminate, to meditate on ways to get our righteous turf back. That's what we're thinking about all the time. Ways to even the score. Now, this is dealt with kind of humorously on the show Seinfeld years ago. If you know that show... There's an episode where George Costanza is in a meeting with his coworkers, and his, one of his coworkers insults him there, and everybody bursts out into laughter, and, and George doesn't know what to do. And he stews on it for days and days and days, and he thinks up the ideal comeback, and he knows that there's another meeting coming up, and so he has this perfect insult sculpted for this person, And the day before the meeting is to happen, that person quits and takes a job in Ohio. So this this revenge is taken away from George. So what does George do? He goes to Ohio, and he sets up a meeting with the brass uh, for that business. And he comes into there, and he sits down. He has this insult, and and he says this perfectly sculpted insult, and the person snaps right back with an even bigger one that hurts him more, and everybody bursts out into laughter. 
One of the things that made Seinfeld such a brilliant show was it brought to the surface in a humorous way, I think, situations and thought patterns that are common to all of us. We're all George Costanza's to a greater and lesser degree in this, aren't we? That's what we do. When we're hurt, we want to hurt back, don't we? We want to retaliate. And we want more than is just. Our flesh wants the scales tipped in our, ba- in our balance, in our favor, and we feel that is just. Our flesh wants a pound, our, our, our sinful nature wants a pound of flesh for an ounce of offense. One of the most quoted lines in the movies Untouchables is when uh, Sean Connery plays this ex-cop called Jim Malone, and he's teaching uh, Elliot Ness, played by Kevin Costner, how to deal with the mob. And he says this line. He says, when he pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He puts one of yours in the hospital, you put one of his in the morgue. That kind of describes our sense of justice, doesn't it? pound of flesh for an ounce of offense. It's part of our fallen nature. It goes all the way back to Genesis 4. That's what Genesis 4 is actually trying to teach us. Right after the fall, it's trying to teach us this is kind of who we are. In the line of of Cain, you have Lamech there at the end of Genesis 4. And he's this prideful kind of blowhard. He's He's a polygamist and a murderer. And he sings this boastful song at the end of chapter 4 to his two wives And he says, I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech, 70 times seven. The Bible is telling us is that that's kind of how we feel justice should work. I get hurt seven times. You get hurt 70 times. I want that type of retribution. So... If you cut down one of my trees to get a better view of the water, I'm going to cut down three of your trees. If you spill coffee on me, I'll bankrupt you. You cut one of my traps, I feel justified in cutting ten of your traps. Tokyo police arrested a man who was upset about being denied entrance into a university 14 years ago. He was so bitter about being refused entrance that he decided to, to, that he blamed this interviewing professor. And he, so he decided to call that professor every day 10 times between the hours of 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. every day for 14 years. Over 50,000 calls to get back at that person. 50,000. That is the selfish perversion of justice. We want the golden rule to be turned on its head, don't we? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We want do unto others as they have done to you and more. And that is exactly what happened in Jesus' day. Lex Talionis had been perverted into this, this kind of freedom to retaliate excessively a license for excessive retribution. It was so ironic. About a month and a half ago, I was in the post office, and a woman I know came up to me, and we started talking. And, and she actually had a question about this text. She said, I don't, I don't get it. I'm so confused. How could the Bible condone such vengeance as a tooth for tooth, she asked me. Do you see how she's seeing this text? Do you see how she's understanding it? How many people still understand tooth for a tooth as being a a kind of excessive retribution law? A law that was intended to give equal justice and mitigate excessive revenge becomes license for excessive revenge. And it's to this that Jesus gives this radical challenge to our flesh. He's giving us a radical challenge here. To die to self. Look with me at verse 39. 39, Jesus says, But I say to you, 
Do not resist the one who is evil. That's the first words out of his mouth. Here Jesus is not pushing aside lex talionis at all, any more than he's pushed aside oaths previously or adultery or murder. God still demands even-handed justice. So, so what's going on here? What is Jesus telling us, them, and us to do? Is Jesus calling us to the, to the exact opposite extreme of being this like milk toast passivity, just letting everything wash over you? I don't think so. John MacArthur writes, he does not teach here as many have claimed that no stand against evil is to be taken and that it should be simply allowed to take its course. That's, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Again, the first rule of proper biblical interpretation is what? Anybody? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. In other words, when you're confused about a text, when you're confused, is this really saying what I think it says? Look at the other Scriptures that speak to this. And if you do, if you take just a, a few minutes to look through the New Testament or even think through the New Testament, you remember that Jesus st stood up to the evil of the money changers in the temple, didn't he? He wasn't, didn't let that evil just wash over him. Paul stands up to the evil of the Roman Empire and, and demands his rights as a citizen in Acts 16, doesn't he? Paul again stands up to the evil the apostle Peter was doing in the church of Galatia. Do you remember that? When, when Peter was, was pulling back from, from the Gentiles, Peter, I mean, uh, Paul takes him to task. We're to resist the evil that the devil is doing all over. That's what James uh, 4, 7 and 1 Peter 5 tell us. Resist the devil. We're to resist the evil even when it infiltrates the, the family of God. 1 Corinthians 5. If there is an unrepentant sinner among us, we are to excommunicate them. We're to resist evil, brothers and sisters. So what Jesus is doing here is he's actually addressing our hearts personally. He's actually poking and prodding around in our hearts. He's deeply challenging our own righteousness. He's deeply challenging our own righteousnesses. That's what makes this passage so hard. That's why when I was reading it, as I said before, when we read this, there's all kinds of buts going on, aren't there? There's all kinds of, but, but what about this situation? But what about this situation? Uh, but Blake, you know, if we're not supposed to do that, what about this situation? What's going on there, brothers and sisters, is, is when you're reacting like that to a biblical text, it's actually challenging some of your righteousnesses. And you've got to stop and listen. Those butts are our flesh desperately, desperately trying to regain our little turves of righteousness. To regain our footing through what we think is justice when we are hurt and insulted and demeaned. What we feel as Jesus walks us through our gospel calling is our flesh springing to life, chafing against our gospel calling. And Jesus' call is simple but extremely challenging, and here it is. Jesus calls us to proactively look for an opportunity for grace when our personal righteousnesses are challenged. Let me repeat that. What Jesus is doing here is he's calling us to proactively look for an opportunity for grace when we feel our personal righteousnesses are challenged. He's calling us to do the same principle that Paul wrote about in Romans 12. You know it. He wrote, do not pay anyone evil for evil. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And he ends that section by saying, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good. It's the same principle. Brothers and sisters, this is hard to accept. This is hard stuff we're entering into. When we seek to gain our righteousness when we're hurt, 
we are actually being overcome by evil. Does that make sense? The only way to overcome evil is by looking for the grace in that moment that you can do. That's the way you overcome it. That's the way your heart changes. God is not interested in your behavior. He's interested in your heart. And it's those moments, those opportunities, that give us the opportunity to change. And Jesus has four examples here that are really hard. Really hard examples. Look at verse 39. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. What's Jesus doing here? What Jesus is doing is asking his sons and daughters to die to their right to retaliate when insulted. He's asking us to die to our right to retaliate when we're insulted, when we're hurt. Most people were right-handed in that day as they are today. And if I'm facing you, if I'm going to strike you on your right cheek, I'm going to actually give you a backhanded slap. Now, in, in, the, in the Jewish society, a backhanded slap is, is much like it is today, probably more so back then. But if you get a backhanded slap, if somebody just goes, huh, slaps you on the back, cheek on the back of their hand, it's, it's more than insulting than when you're slapping them the other way. It's like telling them, you're, you're nothing to me. You're less than nothing to me. That's a deep insult. It's calculated contempt and disdain. Being considered inconsequential, not worth my time. That's one of the most pride-provoking actions that can be done to you. I don't know about you, but, but there are some things that get my Irish up more than others. And this is one of them. This is one of them. If I'm, if I'm deemed not worthy of something or, or less than nothing or with disdain, God, that, that just gets me going. But Jesus says here, it's an opportunity ripe for the gospel. Ripe for the gospel. In the early part of the 19th century in England, there was a tough miner named Billy Bray before his conversion, he was a boxer, and a pretty good one. As the story goes, there was a man who was deathly afraid of Bray, who worked with him in the mines, and found out about his conversion and decided to put his conversion to the test. So he went up to Bray, this strapping boxer, and he punched him. And he waited. And Bray looked up at him and said, May God forgive you, as he's forgiven me, and more. The man struggled for days on Bray's reaction in words. He knew what Bray was capable of, and he knew that the natural man in Bray wanted to just lay him out. But he didn't. Now, as the story goes, the, this man eventually became a Christian. Now, our dying to self doesn't always end that way, brothers and sisters. You know, that's why these are sermon illustrations and our lives are just lives. But what Jesus is saying here is when insulted, don't retaliate. When insulted, don't, don't be a George Costanza. Don't, don't, don't as, as that author said, brood over it or pry into their malice. Don't demand your pound of flesh. Solomon wrote, a prudent man overlooks an insult in Proverbs 12. The apostle Peter agreed. He says, do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called. Sounds a lot like 1 Peter 2 that we just wrote, read. Right? It starts out that way. You were called. As Christians, we're called to die to our natural reactions and desires. That's the life that we have been called to. To radically absorb hurt. 
And that's hard. Secondly, Jesus says, if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Here's a second hard one. What Jesus is doing here is asking us, his sons and daughters, to die to our rights. Die to our rights. See, back in Old Testament law, they, you had an, a tunic that you wore underneath, but then you always had a cloak or a robe. And that cloak or robe was put in, into uh, the canon as a right of yours. So even if you lost your robe in a, in a court case, the Old Testament law says that every day at the end of the day, you have to bring that robe back to that person because many times they use that as their only blanket, as their bed. The, the outer cloak was a right of the Jew. And what Jesus is saying here is, you know that right that you have under law, by the way? You're to give that up. He's using an extreme example of a legal right to challenge how righteous our hearts really are. This is one of the harder ones, brothers and sisters. Our pride might be willing to relent if, if a brother or sister speaks into our life, or if we're wrong, we're willing to relent. But when we have a little righteous ground to stand on, if the law says it, you're not budging me off that. That's my right. Under law, objectively. And Jesus says, no. There's a sonship quote, the discipleship material that, that we use where the, one of the speakers says, it's hard not to act superior when you are. Equally here, it's hard not to claim your righteousness when you are. That's, that's one of the harder ones. That's when we become unbending. Give us a little legal turf and we're rigid. So Jesus uses this legal example to draw out where our personal lines in the sand really are. What are your lines that you hold as an absolute? Think about that. Where, where are your lines in the sand? Here, no further. Yeah, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you 95%, but not this 5%. There's a lot of personal rightness right now, isn't there? Because of this COVID-19 thing. A lot, of, a lot of rightness around masks, isn't there? I feel it when I go out. We all feel it. Whether, whatever side you're on. Some are righteous about not wearing a mask. That's my right. Constitution. Some are righteous about wearing masks only in stores. That's all she's demanding of me. That's all I'm going to do. Some are righteous about wearing a mask anytime you go outside the home. We are all judge and resent people who tell us to do otherwise, don't we? And here Jesus is prodding and probing into our hearts and asking, are those rightnesses movable? Are you willing? Where's your line? In this verse, what he's doing is he's trying to get us to actually consider all of our righteousnesses as filthy rags. Gosh, that sounds pretty biblical, doesn't it? It's a tough one all of our righteousnesses, even when we're right. Then Jesus goes on in verse 41 and says, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. What Jesus is doing here is he's asking us, his sons and daughters, to die to our right to retaliate when we're oppressed. Die to our right to retaliate when we're oppressed. Roman law gave, gave the, all the Roman soldiers the right of what's called conscription, where they 
could find a civilian to, to carry their pack. Interestingly enough, many times their pack carried the very weapons with which they oppressed the people. So they're carrying their own method of oppression, very similar to Jesus, right? He took the cross that he was going to be crucified on. So we can be very much like Christ here. But Jesus tells us here to do it willingly, unbegrudgingly. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he says, go beyond what's required. You want to you wanna really be like Christ? You want to really be like me? Go beyond what's required. Michael Green of the Oxford Center of Christian Apologetics once asked a black South African leader how he responded on many occasions when he was humiliated and mistreated by the whites during apartheid down there. The black man replied, when I've been unjustly forced into some menial action, I complete it, and then I turn to the person and ask if there is anything else that he would like me to do to help him. Green asked how people usually responded to that. And he said, this totally takes the wind out of their sails. They can hardly believe any wrong party would respond like that. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. Take the wind out of people's sails. Take the wind out of their pride. When we're robbed of our cherished freedom and liberty, there's an opportunity for an act of grace, isn't there? An opportunity to act like Christ. Finally, we look at the example given in verse 42. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. What Jesus is doing here is asking his sons and daughters to die to the right of self-preservation. It's one of our basic inborn rights, isn't it? Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote about this. He says, It is Jesus' way of saying that the spirit which says, What I have I hold, and what is mine is mine, and I can't listen to a request of those other people because they ultimately, ultimately I may suffer. That way of living is completely wrong. He's rebuking the wrong spirit of those who are always considering themselves, whether they're being struck on the face, whether their coat is being taken, whether they're compelled to carry baggage, or to give their own goods and wealth to help someone in need. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's challenging us to die to ourselves in this passage. Yes, sometimes pursuing Lex Talionis is fine. But if you want to change, if you want to really change, brothers and sisters, start dying to your rightness. That's what Jesus is saying. Start refusing to regain that righteous footing that we all deeply desire. Start, as Jesus said, in those moments, taking up your cross and denying yourself and following Christ. Start losing your life right there in that moment. That's your opportunity that God has put in your life when you feel put down, disdained, oppressed, slapped, insulted, your legal right taken away. That's your opportunity. Doing these seemingly nonsensical things will have effect not only on the people when you're, that, you're, that did it to you, but Jesus is saying it has an effect on your heart. It has an effect on you. So don't read this passage looking for small patches of righteousness. Next time you read this passage, catch yourself when you say, but, however. Look, don't look to insert those words. And read it in light of who is telling you this. Who's telling us this? Jesus Christ. Tim Keller in his book, Conversions About Christmas, writes this. 
I've heard people say, I'm checking out Christianity, but I also understand Christians can't do this, and the Bible says you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to love the poor. You're supposed to give up sex outside of marriage. I can't accept that. Some people want to come to Christ with a list of conditions, he writes. But the real question is this. Is there a God who is the source of all beauty and glory in life? And if you know Christ will fill your life with his goodness and power and joy so that you will live with him in endless ages with his life increasing in you every day, if that's true, you'd willingly say things like, you, you, you wouldn't say things like, you mean I have to give up? Dot, dot, dot. Let's say you have a friend who's dying of some terrible disease, so you take him to the doctor and the doctor says, I have a remedy for you. If you just follow my advice, you'll be healed and you will live a long and fruitful life. There's only one problem. While you're taking my remedy, you can't eat chocolate. Now, what if your friend turns to you and says, forget it. No chocolate? What's the use of living? Okay, I'll follow my doctor's remedy, but I'm going to eat chocolate too. If Christ is really God, then all conditions are gone. To know Jesus Christ is to say, Lord, anywhere your will touches my life, anywhere your word speaks, I will say, Lord, I will obey. There's no conditions anymore. We have to come to him and say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to let you start to completely reorder my life. As we leave this passage, let that sink in today and allow the Lord to completely reorder our life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. And Spirit, again, I implore you, these are just black ink on white paper. They are powerless without you. I ask you to change us, Lord, to challenge us, to reorder our lives and help us to obey you, even when it's hard. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I ask you to please stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, which is Hallelujah, What a Savior. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may be with one voice glorifying God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's respond to the God's presence with us today.
is wrong.